by the instruction he received in Shanty tradition, law, and statecraft. On returning to Ghana, he successfully established his own, his own business. From there, to widespread delight and acclaim, he was chosen from several candidates to occupy the role of the Chancellor, the role of the traditional ruler in modern Africa is delicate, not infrequently difficult. He has to protect the new to the best of the past while encouraging the beneficial change. The combination of the contemporary and the traditional negotiator to his training and his personal abilities, not least the quality of his abundant charm, has fitted him to be king of a people who are immensely proud of their past, but who are also entirely at home in the modern world. As a university, we particularly applaud one of his many steps to create a better life for us. His determination to improve education. Shortly after his accession, he set up the Two for Education Fund. Large numbers of bursaries were immediately awarded to primary school children and to undergraduates, and grants were made to many secondary schools. He has made it abundantly clear that he sees high quality education as the key to the future prosperity of the Shanty. In awarding this degree, we recognize the policies and achievements of all safety to the center. We also acknowledge two other things. The first is the continuing relationship between Scotland and Shanty, and indeed the rest of Africa. Many Scots, some of them are graduates, have served there as teachers, doctors, missionaries, engineers, and in many other roles. The great has not referred to Shanty. In the 1920s and 1930s, Robert Sutherland Rattray, who was still remembered there with deep respect, was, as his name suggested, a Scot. And the last chief commissioner of the Shanty was also a Scot. Before them, in between, and since then, there have been many, many more. But the flow goes both ways, and this university has been enriched by the numerous Shanty. While the city of Glasgow has been and is a home of the nation. Today our research teams with Ghanaian universities are stronger than ever. And we continue to welcome the Shanty students here, some of them children of our own graduates. The second thing that we acknowledge in the war in this degree, and to which we pay hard for it, is the creativity generation after generation of Africans, who, over millennia, built the traditional states of Africa. In the West, this aspect of Africa is too often overshadowed by reports of horrors and miseries. Reports of obscure creativity, <coughs> obscure creativity, the wisdom, and the deep compassion of the African people. Today, in many places, it is the traditional rulers and the traditional political systems established, tested, and refined over hundreds of years that provide stability and are a source of wisdom and justice. Those people who have a king and the qualities of the Holy Spirit are especially fortunate, for he is able to balance the needs of modern statehood maintaining the proud traditions of his ancestors. Chancellor, in recognition of his leadership, his untiring efforts to improve the life of his people, and of the links between our two nations, I now invite you to the Otunfo Jose II, the honorary degree doctor.
great great grandfather, the late Prince of Wales, and late King Edward VII, received an honorary doctor from the Wars on the 8th of October 1868. His great grandfather, also Prince of Wales at the time, the late King George V, received a degree on the 23rd of April 1907. And his grandparents, the future King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, received honorary doctors of war at the Duke and Duchess of York on the top of October 1932. But above all, today we honor the Duke of Rosse on this commemoration day in our 550th anniversary year for his important personal contribution to education, to the interests of young people, and to the support of causes of national and international importance. His recognition is personal and not simply another step in the family scene. In tune with the best of modern practices, much can be learned about our honorary brethren through a visit to his internet website, www.princewales.gov.com. <laughs> <laughs> this brings out very clearly that the Duke of Rosse, with a strong sense of social awareness, no doubt brought about in part through his experience as the first heir to the throne not to be educated at home, and as the first to complete his university. This awareness has matured a deep commitment to service the community. One clear manifestation of this is his role as patron or president of more than 300 organizations, whose range of interests include young people, the unemployed, the disabled, the elderly, the countryside and rural communities, the problems of the inner cities, the education, medicine, particularly cancer, the arts, conservation, national heritage, environment, architecture, and sport. If that is not enough, he is also an honorary life member of 200 other organizations. In all of these involvements, he has made it clear that he will not be affiliated. He accepts no position unless he has the time to give active views. It is also clear that the Prince cares deeply about the standards and quality of education, which he has called, quote, the number one priority for the future. He seeks to encourage and celebrate excellence, but at the same time to help his advantage. To help those advantages put their talents to the best possible use. He believes that the higher standards of education are a crucial means of helping young people understand the world as they are part of the civilization and society they have inherited. An understanding which is the only basis of safeguarding for future generations, the time of what we devise. Today I have only time to run on two very clear examples of these beliefs. First, the Prince's Trust. Its establishment in 1976 became a strongly held conviction on the part of His Royal Highness that a way should be found to tackle the alienation of many young people in society by encouraging challenge, adventure, self help, and a sense of social responsibility. Over the years, the trust has expanded to such a degree that, together with related organizations, it has now helped more than 400,000 disadvantaged young people to fulfill ambitions for themselves or their communities, with another 50,000 given small grounds for loans and set up the business, and over 50,000 completing the Prince's Trust volunteers to their full government. In addition, the Trust Study Support Initiative, which has now been taken up by government, has given tens of thousands of young people the opportunity to learn and study in an effective way outside school. In its first quarter of a century of existence, the Prince's Trust has achieved a great deal. But it is a tribute to its founder that the organization continues to move forward. This year, it will raise and spend some 45 million pounds supporting another 25,000 young people. The Prince's Trust has a clear agenda to target the disadvantage, particularly among those young people who are the hardest to help, in order to harness their potential and turn it into success. In Scotland, the Prince's Trust has so far assisted another 50,000 or so young people to succeed in overcoming obstacles in their way. The organisation of management of the Trust in Scotland has now been involved for separate chairman and council on his equity, allowing Scottish issues to be addressed more effectively and helping the Trust to focus its efforts in a carefully targeted way on the areas of greatest need. My second example, and also of real importance in the Scottish context, is the Prince of Scottish Youth Business Trust, which provides seed for the finance, professional support, 
for the young people in Scotland aged 18 to 25 to enable them to sit up and run their own business. Again, this trust has particular concerns for the disadvantage and it helps the young, whoever they are and where they come from. The trust was launched in 1989 and is now firmly established throughout Scotland and 18 regions with its headquarters in Glasgow. As a charity with a firm belief in the value of enterprise, its key to success is the desire and ambition of the young people themselves. For many, they have taken the opportunities of support from the Trust to set up their own businesses. What is gratifying is that in the first very demanding year of trading for these embryonic businesses, more than 82% have survived and 53% still in business after two years. The total turnover of this trust now exceeds 80 million pounds. Its contribution to Scotland and to the young people of Scotland is of great importance. If you change the term separate board and try to help on even the most effective, efficient and exciting new enterprise development organisation in Scotland. The Youth Business Trust believes that by enabling young people to make a significant contribution it also enables local communities to invest in youth the enterprise. These are, of course, the same beliefs which led to the original founding of the Princess Trust 25 years ago, and the Princess Trust Scotland and the Youth Business Trust work closely together to achieve the most effective and meaningful assistance to Scotland's young people today. For one with so many varied commitments, it is not surprising. Duke of Rosso does not let grass grow under his feet. Each year he undertakes a great many public engagements in Britain and overseas. Last year, more than 600. He makes time to meet local community groups and people involved with the project and organisation. There are also a host of private meetings involving people from all walks of life, where the Duke seeks to use his special position to encourage, to support, and to comfort, as well as to inform himself on the many issues. Discussions are held with government ministers, with political figures, with academics, with the business community, and with experts in many fields. And these give the Royal Highness access to a wide range of opinion and thinking on national and international issues. Chancellor, when one considers all these singular activities and achievements, it is evident that the university is privileged today to be able to add his name to our role. Chancellor, it is with the greatest pleasure that I ask you to confer the honour of your doctor of law of Prince Charles.